Perspective Shift, Unveiling Paradigms and Perceptions Navigating Christian doctrines can be overwhelming. Returning to biblical interpretation is vital for clarity and unity. Shifting perspectives to align with the Word of God brings authenticity to our faith. Let's seek truth together with open hearts and minds. Perspective Shift with Dare Akinsanya Hello everyone, my name is Dare Akinsoya and welcome to this week's episode. In the last episode, we examined the five sequential actions Jesus took from the account in Matthew 14, 19. The first was to maintain a calm state and making the multitudes to sit down. Secondly was that he accepted the five loaves and the two fish that was given to him, insinuating that no resource is too small in God's hands. The third was he looked up to heaven, acknowledging that help comes from God. And the fourth was to offer thanksgiving despite the circumstance and bless the resource in his hands. And the final fifth step was to launch out in faith and gave the loaves and the fish to the disciples to distribute. We will linger a little longer on Matthew 14, 19 and suck out the profound revelations contained within it. This week, we will focus on a different dimension in the first step that Jesus took. The first section of Matthew 14, 19 hinted on something worth exploring much deeper than we even looked at in the last episode. We focused our discussion on the calm state of mind that Jesus displayed and how he maintained decorum in the midst of what could have been very chaotic. Mark shared a little more detail on what really happened. Mark 6, 39 and 40 Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. From that passage, Jesus did not just display absolute confidence that he had in God, he also instilled confidence in the people. In instilling confidence, he also demonstrated the importance of organizational structure, which we are basing today's discussion on. The structures that sustain systems are focused primarily on three major tenets, which include people, processes, and technology. Material resources are bundled under technology, of course. Having the right people and the right technology gives us effectiveness and using appropriate processes to maximize the human and material resources that we have produces efficiency. The right mix of all three tenets is very crucial. Lack of one of the tenets inhibits functionalism. Good people plus sound resources without an adequate process does not cut it. Likewise, having a sound process without the right people or resource is not ideal. The key is the right balance. In our world today, many Christians inappropriately attribute all actions to be spiritual and neglect diligence. God will not reward diligence if it is not needed in our Christian work. Second Peter 1, 5 through 9 But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. This scripture mainly says, Yes, it's a good thing that we are now born again, that is, we have activated the spiritual being inside of us. But being spiritual 
does not mean we have to neglect diligence. Our walk of faith is also part of our diligence. And Peter was saying that when we neglect this, we are being short-sighted. Don't get me wrong. The spiritual realm controls the physical realm. The Bible offers several passages that emphasize the influence of the spiritual realm over the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This verse clearly states that our struggles are not merely physical, but are rooted in the spiritual realm, which involves spiritual forces. Also from Daniel chapter 10 verses 12 and 13, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. This passage also highlights the spiritual battle that took place in the heavenly realms, affecting events on earth as Daniel's prayers were answered but delayed by spiritual impedance. Also, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down stronghold. Paul teaches that the real battle is spiritual and that the weapons we use are not physical. They are not supposed to be physical, but spiritual and empowered by God. Let's also take a look at Matthew. Matthew 16, 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus here was teaching the disciples that they have been given authority to function in the spiritual realm, so that whatever we bind here is actually first bound in heaven, and then we'll see the manifestations on earth. And whatever we lose right here as believers is also loosed in heaven, which now has manifestations in the physical realm. Let's look quickly at Job as well. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered to the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The conversation between God and Satan happened in the heavenly realms, in the spiritual realms, but it impacted Job's life on earth. These scriptures demonstrate the interconnectedness of the spiritual and physical realms highlighting the importance of spiritual awareness and the readiness in life as a believer. Both the spiritual and physical were designed by God to work together. 
Colossians 1.16 For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. The visible things are natural things that we see, and the invisible are the spiritual things that we do not see with our natural eyes. There is a reason why we work, eat and learn things. God has the capacity to make things happen without requiring us to do any of the things mentioned. Yet, he says that the one that does not work does not deserve to eat, thereby emphasizing the importance of diligence. The spiritual control over physical manifestation mainly focuses on approvals and disapprovals. This means that our actions on earth need approvals from heaven for us to see the manifestations. From the story of Job, of course, it is interesting that Satan and his courts also need approvals from heaven to be able to unleash their calamities. I've heard and seen people argue that marketing is a taboo and that all a church needs to do for growth is to pray, to bring people to church. I wonder if, if the people truly understand what marketing is all about. The same people worship in a designated place of worship, located in a particular place, and often print out flyers to invite guests to events. Yet they frown on having a marketing team that actually evaluate the services a church offers and tailor the services to the needs of the people and the environment. The truth is everyone operates a level of marketing already, even on an individual basis, and the results we all get depends mostly on the approvals we receive from heaven and partly by the marketing strategies we adopt. To fail to plan is a marketing strategy that is focused on a failure outcome, which is a plan to fail. No matter what we do, we are always planning towards something, whether we do it intentionally or unknowingly. The Bible, however, documents that there is wisdom in intentional planning and execution which allows us to control or influence an outcome. It is equally bad, if not worse, to depend solely on our natural abilities and put spirituality on reserve bench. It is merely asking for trouble. Pride is imminent and God detests pride, meaning that it is a disservice to ourselves to not acknowledge God or involve Him in the things that we do. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. And likewise, in Luke 14, 28 and 29, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Before undertaking a task, one must commit the task in God's hand first, then sit down and evaluate what we have and determine what we need and then launch out in faith. Jesus is anointed beyond measure according to John 3.34, yet he adopted the principle of structure. Shouldn't we, who are aspiring to be like him, follow in his footsteps? Identifying targets or goals for a project or task is very important. And equally important is counting the cost to know if we are able to finish or if there are adjustments that need to be made. How does this apply to individual tasks, someone may ask. In my marketing class in business school, the instructor gave us an assignment to do a personal SWOT analysis, which sounded strange, but I was excited. I had always thought SWOT analysis was for business plans, and then it 
it made a lot of sense and I saw the value in it. The fact that it is one thing to know who we are, what we believe and how we portray ourselves. But it is another thing to know how other people perceive us. I had some rude awakening after the exercise and I came, came out knowing what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are, who my competitors are, and what are the external forces I have to grapple with as an individual in the job market. I started focusing more on my strengths and reduced the time spent on my weaknesses. Now, anything that does not have direct input or impact in terms of value to the aspirations that I have are gradually being moved out of the front rows to give room for the things that do. This, of course, is in addition to praying without ceasing. What am I saying? As individuals, we do not just leave a structure to things that happen in businesses alone. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And this emphasizes the importance of spirituality over physicality. Nonetheless, being all physical, that is being all diligent and neglecting spirituality is also a very bad idea. Doing both ceaselessly will yield the best results for us. Someone may ask or wonder, how can we do both simultaneously? Good question. The simple answer is being diligent in our spirituality and being spiritual in our diligence. A simple example of being diligent in spirituality is the requirement to pray without ceasing. Praying without season is a call to consciously communicate with God in prayers, in our words and our thoughts. Allowing our minds to wander and wallow in complaints is a stray from diligence. Perseverance that we talk about is an attribute of diligence. Continuing to pray even when it is difficult or when nothing seems to be happening is diligence rooted in faith. On the other hand, spirituality in diligence is the effort to do one's part while maintaining faith and reliance in God, giving it our full consideration, our undivided attention and our mental and spiritual concentration to any task that's been assigned to us. For example, a task that contradicts God's instruction does not fall under spirituality intelligence, no matter how engrossed we are on it. Let's round up with biblical examples where organizational structure was put in place in a spiritual setting. The leadership model of Moses provides a foundational example of delegation and structured authority. Moses was overwhelmed by the demands of leading Israelites and received advice from his father-in-law Jethro to delegate some responsibilities. Jethro advised Moses to appoint capable men as leaders over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. This structure ensures efficiency and prevents burnout for leaders when we adopt it. Imagine if Jesus were to distribute the food by himself to all 5,000 families that were there. The first family served will already be hungry by the time the last family got served and it will be overwhelming for everyone. By asking the disciples to sit down in groups of fifties and hundreds, Jesus was demonstrating the power of structure and organization it was easier to count groups than counting individuals and it is a lot easier to assign resources to groups than directly assigning them to individuals. It's probably the structured arrangement that facilitated the estimate of how many people were fed in the encounter. 
The Bible provides a multifaceted approach to organizational structure, emphasizing the importance of leadership, delegation, and unique roles of each member within a community. This, however, does not leave out our own individual structure. Believers must learn to establish the right mix between spirituality and diligence and not substitute one for the other. Both will yield the best results when constant, that is, being diligent in spirituality and being spiritual in our diligence. I pray tonight that God will grant us the grace to do the needful in every situation that we are faced with. I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to go with us into any situation that may feel challenging and may the power of the Holy Spirit suppress every opposition against us. May we receive the empowerment to be diligent in our spiritual walk with God and also receive grace to apply spirituality in our diligent walk. May all our efforts be crowned with glory in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And with that, we have come to the end of this week's episode. I thank you for your time and I want to encourage you to connect with me on akinsd.com forward slash podcast or go to the YouTube podcast channel and leave your comments. I like reading them and you never know who your comments will encourage. Again, I hope that this has been of some value to you and I want to thank you for listening. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead. And remember, Jesus is Lord of all. Hallelujah. Amen.